Thank you for joining us in worship today. Good morning. All are welcome in the house of the Lord. Let us glorify God together. Let us join in one accord to praise our creator. Please join us in our welcome song. Let us join in the call to worship, taken from Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before her with joyful songs. Know that the faithful one is God. It is God who made us, and we are God's. We are God's people, the sheep of God's pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his course with praise. Give thanks to her and praise her name. For the Lord is good and her love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let us worship the Lord. Let us stand if you are able and join in singing hymn 756, O God of Every Nation.
one, still our busy minds. Focus our hearts on your word for us on this day. Free us to listen and absorb the message you have for us. Amen. Our first passage comes from Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers, he said? The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading comes from the book of Acts, first chapter, verses 1 through 9. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote all about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. How many times have you watched a movie or an action, TV action show, and the main character is running from danger or maybe just lost? The ominous music begins, and you scream out, do not go down that dark alley. Alleys have gotten a bad rep. While the dictionary defines an alley as a narrow passageway between buildings, popular culture has defined them as dark 
places where rats, the homeless, muggers, and danger hang out. Or it's a throwaway space where you park your car or you put your garbage cans or you dump your trash that you don't feel like taking to the landfill. But as I read my Bible, it occurred to me that Jesus must have spent a lot of time with people who were pushed into the dark back alleys of daily life. The outcast, the poor, the oppressed, the sick, the homeless, the sinners, the tax collectors, the lonely, the afflicted ones, and the folks who have lost their way. While the Pharisees and the Sadducees debated the fine points of the Torah, gilded their temples, and performed empty rituals and discussed whether to cooperate with the Roman occupiers, an itinerant Palestinian carpenter from a backwater village was going around calling people who had good steady jobs and families to leave them and follow him. He called them to follow him as he brought the message of God's love to those whom society did not love. He called them to follow him to eliminate the fear that creates oppression, to eradicate the greed that creates poverty and war, to overcome the myth of separation that creates environmental destruction, and to transform lives by bringing the light of truth to the dark shadows of their souls. Jesus calls us to follow him, not to put him on a pedestal and proclaim him perfect so we don't have to emulate what he does. Instead, he calls us to follow him, to live our lives as he lived, in complete surrender to God's will and in complete devotion to spread God's love. The song Craig sang, Take Me to an Alley, is one of my favorites. During a live performance, the author, Gregory Porter, explained his inspiration behind the song. He was eight years old, living in Bakersfield, California. It was one of those 110 degree days that you get in California. His mother had just bought a Cadillac El Dorado. Now, if you are a certain age, you understand and remember the El Dorado. It was long. It was big. It was too long. The El Dorado was not new, but it was new to the Porter family. So Gregory put on his mirror sunglasses, jumped in the back seat, pulled down the armrest, and imagined that his mother was a chauffeur as they drove home. Somebody's phone is ringing. Anyway, along the way, his mother spotted a man lying on the pavement. Porter said his skin must have been burning from the heat and he had wasted on himself. His mother stopped their new El Dorado, picked up the small man, put him in the front seat, and took him not to the hospital, but to their home. She cleaned him up, got him sober, and gave him some of Gregory's clothes, so he must have been really small. He stayed there for two weeks. Like any eight-year-old would be, Gregory was angry that his mother had picked up this man in his El Dorado, put him in his house, and gave him his clothes. It took him a long time to realize that his mother was teaching him a lesson about what is important in life. Thus the song, Take Me to the Alley. Gregory Porter's mother was living out the example Jesus gave us and gave his disciples in today's scripture in what we know as the parable of the Good Samaritan. We all know the story. As Jesus was preaching to his disciples, a lawyer, probably an expert in Jewish law, tries to trap Jesus 
by asking him what one must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus turns the question back on him and asks him what the Torah says. The man replies that it says you should love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. But the lawyer presses on, asking, who is my neighbor? Jesus uses the example of a Jewish traveler who is attacked, robbed, and left for dead on the Jericho Road. At that time and today, Jews consider themselves from one of three lineages, either as priests who are descended from Aaron, Levites who are descended from other children of Levi, or Israelites who are descended from the children of Jacob other than Levi. Their community was everything. To the community in Jesus' day, your neighbor was a member of your ethnic group or religion, and everybody else was a stranger. Actually, that sounds a lot like it is today. So a priest passed the man by, and a Levite kept going. Jesus' crowd must have expected the hero story to be the third person, which would have been an Israelite. But Jesus chose the mortal enemy of the Jews to rescue the man, take him to an end, and pay for his treatment. Make no mistake about it, Jews and Samaritans hated each other for generations. Jews saw the Samaritans as a dirty half-breed race who worshiped God in the wrong places and in the wrong way. Samaritans didn't think much of the Jews either. Samaritans desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. After Jesus told this parable, but before Luke wrote it in his gospel, the Samaritans killed some Jews headed to Jerusalem. In retaliation, Jews burned down an entire Samaritan village, killing everyone who lived there. They hated each other. Jesus' radical message to his followers was and is to us today that every human being is our neighbor, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, nationality, gender, or political beliefs. Jesus also teaches us that we cannot be passive observers when we see people in need. I don't know why the priest and the Levite passed by, but clearly Jesus says the Samaritan showed his love by acting, by doing something to help. I'm sure the priest and the Levite kept the dying man in their thoughts and prayers, but that was all they did. If the Samaritan had not come along, he would have died. If Gregory Porter's mother had just put the homeless man on a Bakersfield street in her thoughts and prayers, he would have died. Where, whenever there's a tragedy, the shootings at a holiday parade in Illinois, a murder on the streets of Baltimore, a child dying of hunger anywhere, the normal response is, you're in my thoughts and prayers. But our thoughts and prayers do not save their lives. I have a good friend who says God gives us opportunities to follow the example of Jesus, but we keep flubbing it. If we are to be faithful servants of God, we must do more than give thoughts and prayers. The thoughts and prayers only count if they lead to action. We must go into the dark alleys of life and extend a loving hand to whomever we find there, regardless of who they are, where they're from, or what they look like. Because we are all God's children. Gregory Porter's mother and the Samaritan put someone else's welfare above their own. My favorite theologian, Howard Thurman, it says, when Jesus calls us to love one another, he means that I go beyond the good and evil in the object of my affection. To quote him, I deal with a person, not with the fact that he is lovable or unlovable, not with the fact that he is gifted or not gifted, 
not with the fact that he is healthy or unhealthy, not with the fact that he is worthy or unworthy, that he's kind or unkind. All of that becomes secondary. The primary thing is that when I say I love, it means that I'm involved in an encounter that leads from the core of me to the core of you, past all the good things I know about you, beyond all the bad things I know about you. That's why Jesus commanded his disciples to go spread the gospel, not only in Jerusalem and Judea, but also in Samaria. Jesus sent his disciples into the one place where they would be in danger, where they would be among folks who hated them and whom they hated. He sent them into the darkest alleys of their time because God loves us all. God does not make a difference because of our race, our education, our wealth, or our intelligence. God loves us all. As Jesus' followers, we, all of us, are the daily embodiment of God's love. When people see us, they should see God's love in action. And Lord knows we need love right now. I know you are tired of me saying this, but I'm going to keep saying it because the Holy Spirit compels me to say it. So here it is. It is a sin that in Maryland, the richest state in the richest nation in the history of the world, that more than 700,000 persons or more than one in 10 households live in poverty, and struggle to have enough to eat. Children go to bed with empty stomachs while parents and grandparents skip meals so that children can eat. It is a bigger sin if we accept this and do nothing about it. In the city where we live, there is practically a murder every day. It is a sin that more than 10 thousand people have died in the United States due to firearms, not counting suicides, just this year alone. It is a bigger sin if we accept this and do nothing about it. Our nation has always been divided, but today that division runs deeper and is more intractable than ever. Like the Israelites and the Samaritans, we jump into camps with our own kind and live in fear of the stranger. But Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, I know we cannot on our own end hunger, homelessness, war, mass murders, drug abuse, poverty, or racism. But God wants to work through us to change history. Our job is to get our hands dirty, to go into the back alleys of life, to be the light in the darkness, and God will do the rest. If we go back to the dictionary definition of alleys, a narrow passageway between or behind buildings, we can get a vision of what Jesus was about. Being in the alleys of life provides the passageway between the God we serve and the world we live in. God is in the alleys, and Jesus reveals to us that we have to go there to find God and get our hands dirty along with God. God loves us, and we find God when we give away that love. As the body of Christ, we may not have an opportunity to shine God's light like this for generations. It would be a sin if we let it go by. Amen. Thank you.